So we've got a lot of comments to go through this time. <laughs> if you're new to these discussion videos, this will be a listener. I'm going through comments and answering and evaluating them. I'll read or summarize each one and flash it up on screen and we'll chat. Can I be added to the Discord? This question has been coming up in the comments more often lately, so I wanted to talk about it quickly. The Discord server is great. The people on it are awesome. I have channels where I post lore and writing, and then there are other channels for your own world building to ask questions and discuss topics. It's fantastic. Here's the thing about the Discord. There is no Patreon. You don't have to pay anything to join, it's free. But you do have to work for it. Every video I put up gets a new invite link in the description box, but it's only good for the first 50 people to use it, and it usually runs out within two to five hours. I post videos on Saturdays at 7 a.m. Central Standard Time, though not every Saturday. The reason I do it this way is so that access is open to anyone, but the people who get on the Discord really want to be there. Some people set alarms, some turn on notifications, and some say it's taken them months to get on. The people who have gotten on are invested in being there, and for the most part, everyone plays nice with each other. It's the people who find your videos at random later that leave the really nasty, obnoxious comments, and those are the types I don't want on the Discord. And so far, it's worked out really well. There are currently over 500 members now, and things have gone shockingly smooth, which is good because I have zero time or patience for internet drama. Okay, on to Quillian. <laughs> Let's start with geography. My map is probably going to be changing again. Over on the Discord, we were discussing the landmass and climate, and it was suggested that if I alter the mountain range slightly, it will provide a more realistic natural barrier to northwestern neighbors and also a better rain barrier. The climate at this latitude will be fairly mild. Hot summers, cold winters, and there would be a sharp contrast in the climate on either side of the mountains. This means that the forest surrounding that large inlet from the ocean and the unknown neighbors in that direction would almost certainly have been Nautican. It's just like too perfect of a climate for them. There is no way that they'd have passed it up. However, in the modern era, that inlet provides ocean access for several major rivers across the continent. So there is no way that the Enosi wouldn't have won it by this point. Now, the Lake Nauticans, who we've discussed before, all escaped the Rising Empire by returning to the ocean. But what if these Nauticans didn't, and instead joined the Enosi? I had mentioned Nauticans who became assimilated with Enosi culture, but I didn't know where they would be or what their story would be. Now I do. And I think that could be really interesting to explore, this area that still has a majority Nautican population, but Nauticans who are assimilated with Enosi culture to a great extent. That will be a lot of fun later on. So we've estimated the area I've marked off as Quillian territory to be a little less than 90,000 square miles, which is right between Idaho and Oregon in size. Now this isn't huge, but there are a lot of cultures and people groups that I need to fit on this continent, and I don't think it's reasonable that a peaceful group like the Quillian would control a vast chunk of it. Though the fact that they fly and range long distances makes it even smaller, and I think that they will have an extremely small population in total. I never meant for them to be huge, not like millions of people or anything like that, but they might be even smaller in number than I thought. Now there were several critiques on the architecture of Bateaux, and let me just say that they are all fair points. When I was doing the art for that video, there came a moment when I was like, this just doesn't work, there's not enough support. But I was out of time and I didn't know how to draw more support at that eye level angle and have anybody actually be able to see what was going on, so I just left it for the time being. There might need to be some additional structural support under the stove or you could move it to the cellar, which shouldn't be a problem for the temperature up top since heat rises. That way the chimney would also double as structural support for the wooden floor. Okay, I agree that there needs to be more support, possibly a beam in the center of the bateau, and definitely more beams across the floor and supporting the roof, especially if children are going to be playing up around those roof beams. However, I don't think the stove can go in the cellar because it would raise the temperature down there, which would make it much less effective for food storage. And there will probably need to be support in the center because I like the stove being in the middle of the room. It just fits them, I think, being pretty egalitarian to have the heat in the center of the room instead of off to one side. Because then you'd have a pretty clear hierarchy of importance based on who gets to be on the warm side of the room. I think it just fits them in a Knights of the Round Table kind of way. Wouldn't it make more sense to make the roof out of thatch or grass than leather? Um, maybe. <laughs> but I don't think leather doesn't make sense. Leather is strong stuff, and even when parts of the top started to wear out, you could patch and replace just a portion. Also, leather is a byproduct of all of the animals that they already hunt for meat, so it's not like they're going out of their way to find it. When I was drawing the Bateaux out, I was trying to stick more with inspiration from teepees and yurts and other nomadic homes, and thatched roofs just seemed so very European. There would probably be some advantages to thatched roofs, and maybe some Quillian do use them, but they're also very traditional people, and they're into their aesthetics. 
And the big bateaus are basically an expanded version of their little travel tents, like literally, because I came up with the travel tents first and then the big ones. But I think there would be something symbolic to the Quellian about even their permanent homes being reflective of their travel tents. Like their real home is the travel tent. It's out on the plains, not in town. Anyways, I find it compelling enough not to completely throw out the original design. Since leather is heavier than fabric, would it not be more practical to use as much fabric as possible for the travel tents? The walls and sides don't need to be waterproof. Proof. This is true, however, the issue for the Quillian is sourcing fabric. In the past, there were wild mammoths on the plains. You could turn the hide of a mammoth into fur, or you could shear it and then turn it into leather and wool. However, mammoths weren't like sheep. You don't get an annual fleece, you get the fur one time ever. So even then, it wouldn't exactly be an easy material to get a hold of, or abundant. Silvers could have traded with the Nauticans for lotus linen, and the Blacks could trade with the Aegeans for linen and wool and other more standard fabrics. However, in the current day, the Mammoths are gone, and the Nauticans are gone, and the borders are closed, cutting off most trade. So maybe it's not that leather is the best material for their tents, maybe it's just the only material they can reliably get a hold of at this point. The mobile bateaus have flat roofs. That would be fine in dry weather, but during rain, wouldn't the water gather in the center? Maybe there's another pole in the center to make the roof peak a little, to make the water slide off. Or maybe they could add one if they see a storm coming. Yes, I like this. I don't think they'd use an extra pole regularly because it just cut into their already meager floor space. Also, the tarp will need to be reinforced with extra layers where the poles press into them. But during the rain, it would be simple enough to add, and it'd do the job. Also, I like how mildly sloping the roof would add to the resemblance between the travel bateaus and the town bateaus. Something I thought was interesting but didn't have time to discuss in the video is that you can assume a lot about a culture based off of their architecture. I like to world build by feel and then figure out why it makes sense later. Call it confirmation bias if you want. I really like to think of my world as already existing in a way. I like to think of it as something I'm discovering, like theoretical archaeology, which I think works well when you're trying to keep it logical and grounded as much as you can, but slightly illogical because real people and cultures are never perfectly logical, like with the central stoves in the big bateaus. It felt right to me, but it took me a while to figure out that the reason it makes sense is because of their egalitarian social structure. Also, a central fire with families nesting around it inside the same bateau is a mirror to how their travel campsites would work, except then it would be a central fire with families nesting around it inside their own bateaus. If we examine the winter towns and the big bateaus, what conclusions can we draw about Quillian culture? Well, the big thing is that they are incredibly vulnerable structures. Like seriously, your walls are woven cane and leather. A good knife could hack right through. Somebody could probably body slam their way through. This means that they must have an incredibly trusting culture. Close-knit, community-oriented people who feel secure leaving their food and belongings behind in such a house. They also must not be terribly concerned about other flocks or outsiders invading the towns. Maybe the other flocks don't invade because the community element and honor system extends to them. But why aren't they afraid of outsiders? Well, possibly because they roam their territory constantly and no invasion would ever make it close without being discovered from the air. Maybe Quillian feels so secure because they are overpowered and they know it. I'm curious, if they build settlements, why do they migrate at all? Ah, well, they have to. The idea is, originally they didn't migrate. Originally they lived in the towns and flew out every day to hunt and gather. But that wouldn't last long before their population grew too large for the land around their towns to sustain. So they started flying a few days out, and then a week out, then they'd be gone for a month, and the migration pattern slowly evolved that way. Do you think any young Quillian would settle into one place permanently? Like build a more sturdy permanent hut slash cottage somewhere for them and their family to live, and just hunt in their area? Okay, well, you have the societal norms, which is what I like to focus on in these videos, and then you have individual characters who break those norms. I don't think that would be a normal thing to do because the Quillian are so community focused and interdependent. I think something would have to have gone extremely wrong in a Quillian's life for them to become a hermit. However, I'm not set on there being exactly six towns. There were six original towns, but it's possible that water and resources forced new towns to grow at different points. But that will depend on the population when I get that hammered out, and if I do add more towns it will change my borderlines, so… <laughs> but another thing, there are the Quillian who've been banished from all flocks and towns. If there were enough of them, I can see them banding together into their own flock. That's probably the only way they'd survive long term, but they'd need a place to stay during the winter. If they did build their own town, it would be on another town's territory, so there would need to be some kind of agreement made regarding hunting rights on that land. 
Now, this could go in a few interesting directions. Maybe the outcast flocks cause problems. Maybe the other flocks don't like them being there. Kind of like when you're a kid and you get sent to your room and you're like, good, I'll just go read my book. And then your parents hide your book because you aren't supposed to enjoy being grounded. <laughs> Maybe the point is for the outcasts to die off alone and the flocks see it as dangerous to let them build their own community. Maybe they do become dangerous. Maybe they become more powerful or even pirate-like and the flocks join together to wipe them out. If that happened, their bateaus might still stand to this day as a ghost town and a warning. Or maybe the Quellian allow them that town and a small bit of land, but a huge stigma grows. Children are told never to go there when they're flock hopping and the children of the outcasts have to hide their origins if they ever try to leave and join normal flocks. Lots of possibility there. With all of the mingling of different age groups in the winter, would there be fights and arguments often or would it be more chill? You mentioned that it was similar to Thanksgiving or Christmas, so my mind immediately went to the infamous family argument at dinner. Okay, this is funny to me because different families can be so different. That never even crossed my mind, but my family has never had a big blowout argument like that. The worst we do is like sarcasm, passive aggression, and backhanded compliments. However, I think you're completely right. It definitely wouldn't be totally peaceful. <laughs> if your family is prone to arguing, imagine having to share a house for the whole winter, not just one dinner. Now I do have ideas for a holiday called Grudge Day that will probably take place near the end of winter. I think I heard of something similar in Norse cultures, but I can't exactly remember. But basically it's a day that would be sort of like the Quillian version of the Purge. Like if somebody hurt your feelings in the past year and never made it right or never even realized it, you tell them. If you've been holding negativity inside, you let it out. And if there's that one guy in town who just really needs a punch in the face, this is the day. <laughs> Arguments are encouraged, violence is expected, and the healers are on standby. But in the end, once you've let loose and cleared the air, you are supposed to shake hands and move on into the new year as friends again. I really, really doubt it'd go that smoothly, but that's the idea right now. I kind of have the feeling that the stereotypes of different colors are pretty in keeping with the stereotypes of brunettes, blondes, and redheads in real life. Uh, yeah, absolutely. For one, these stereotypes did grow completely organically, at least for me. I was writing and I'm like, okay, I have a character who's gloomy and sad, and my mind immediately pictures him as gray because we associate gray with depression. The same goes for the other colors. Here's the thing, we use the word world building as a catch-all, but it really has two distinct meanings. There is the world building that we do here, which is creating the world as a world outside of any story or context or character. But then there is the world building that you do when you write, which is revealing your world to the audience through your story. And that world building is all about balance. If you world build too much, you lose the story and the characters and also the audience. But if you do too little, your world feels bland or copy and pasted. These stereotypes I would never never explicitly explain in a story. I explain them to you now because we're doing the pre-world building, but it would be ridiculous and clunky to try and explain them in a story. So therefore, I want it to be something that is easy for the audience to intuit without an explanation. How does the creation of areas for avians with different colors contend with the previous development of detailed plans for children of parents with different feathers and the suggestion that avians would be more attracted to partners with a different color? Such distinction between colors as in this video would suggest that at least 90% of people stick to flocks of their own color. Well, I am walking back that video just a little, but not entirely. That's just going to happen as I more thoroughly develop ideas. I originally thought that the Quillian were pretty random and evenly dispersed between the towns, but that changed when I tried to justify the colors by aligning them with the environment. Silvers with snow, grays with water, scarlets with desert, etc. But then it made sense for each town to have started with only one color, and I began moving back the timeline of how far they've mixed. I think they would still be physically attracted to other colors, but now that there are all of these subcultures, that has to play a role too. Regardless of appearances, your culture affects how you view the world, which matters in a relationship. So that might have slowed the color mixing. But if you looked at the demographic charts that I've made, like most of the territories are still pretty well mixed. Large towns like this usually require something akin to a government or court. Yes, I think each town would have a sort of council of elders, probably made of retired Yenintes and other respected members of the town. This council would be in charge of running the towns. There would be a separate council for the current Yenintes of the flocks, which would deal more with issues concerning migration life. However, because of their values, I can't see the council having a ton of authority. Most decisions, like concerning crime and punishment, would be in the hands of the Yenintes of each flock who would, in his turn, be held accountable by his own hunters. There were, again, a bunch of comments concerning wing removal as a punishment. No. Nope. Not for the Quillian. <laughs> 
I compared it to cutting off your hand for stealing, which, sure, lots of historical cultures did that. But it doesn't fit with a quellian. Somebody else compared wing removal to lobotomy, and I think that's a lot more accurate with the spiritual connection quellian have to their wings. Or like, even castration. Like, something that is going to deeply, deeply psychologically affect you. This person suggested wing removal in the case of serial killers and pedos, and I'm sorry, but let me hit back at you. So you're going to take a serial killer, cut off their wings, enrage and psychologically disturb them even more than they already were disturbed, and then like release them back into society. No offense, but that sounds like a terrible plan. <laughs> Nope, no, the Quellian would definitely just kill them. Banishment is the best punishment because it's socially enforced, depending on the severity of the crime. If a crime is too terrible and the flock doesn't feel like the perpetrator can be safely banished without becoming a danger to other flocks, then they just kill them. It makes sense. Other comments suggested feather clipping as an alternative punishment, and I disagree with that one too. It does not make sense for the Quillian. This person said, Quillian don't believe in prisons and cutting people's feathers is essentially locking them out of the sky. And that's a good way to look at it. Their whole angle is to try and avoid retributional punishment and only prevent further damage from happening. So they don't lock up or harm criminals they see as redeemable. They just tell them to go away. Go figure out what's wrong with yourself, but do it far from here and leave your former victims in peace. But also, since we've introduced feather transplanting, I don't think wing clipping would be effective at all. The person could just take a flock's stored feathers, or worse, they might try and steal somebody else's feathers to repair their own wings. So that's not preventing further damage from happening, it's like encouraging it. Nope, I'm sorry all of you bloodthirsty people, banishment makes more sense. During the summer months, who protects the elders? Okay, okay, the messenger guild sort of doubles as a home guard. However, the elders aren't completely incapable. Elder is probably the wrong word for me to be using. I mean it as like respected, a patriarch, somebody with wisdom and experience. I don't mean it strictly as elderly. The elders include everyone who's retired from migrating, and I'm thinking that the average age of retirement is somewhere in your 50s. Again, they are only retiring from hunting and migration, which is a highly strenuous lifestyle. But that doesn't mean they're incapable. So there would still be plenty of young elders who could help with defense and climb ladders and do the other activities too difficult for the actual elderly elders. When you say it's the elderly that tell stories and pass on the wisdom of their forefathers, how does that work? How would the next generation of elders learn about it? Would younger adults not know about it at all? Okay, as we just discussed, there are at least two generations in the Winter Towns. I mean, you can think of the elders as divided into retirees and elderly. So the young elders would learn from the old elders. Also, the elders aren't completely removed from young hunters. They would have the whole winter together to share stories. The young hunters and their children do enjoy stories and storytelling, but the types of stories would be different. The young hunters would share fun bird songs and short stories and parables and fanciful fairy tales and adventure stories and scary stories and news and gossip. The elders, on the other hand, would put in the work to learn the epic myths and the long histories and the formal ceremonial songs. Perhaps the Quillian believe that, in addition to the soul, a person's good qualities reside in the wings, and bad qualities are absorbed from the ground, and maybe reside in the feet. The main idea is the belief that a righteous life means many more years of flying, while a bad life allows those absorbed evils to overcome the wings and lead to early flightlessness. And that is the exact sort of thing I can imagine the elders discussing and theorizing and philosophizing about while they cure meat and tan leather. <laughs> Do you think dance would be a big part of Quillian culture? Like certain dances for certain winter towns, or flocks on holidays, or maybe shamanistic dances for religious or storytelling purposes? Or even just as a way for children to work off some energy? Yes. Yes to all. <laughs> children working off energy, dances as part of stories, dances that include flight and huge leaps and spins through the air. Imagine how we've discussed before that Quillian might be more attracted to movement than color in their clothing. Well, an obvious extension of that would be dance. They might appreciate a pretty face, but then find dance to be absolutely mesmerizing. I've been thinking about how the hunting and gathering would work. Basically, I imagine that each flock would eventually be made up of couples that form hunting partners. Every so often, depending on how far they would travel, a party of like two or three couples would go off and hunt, while the other couples, children and pregnant or nursing women, would stay and gather. In this way, day-to-day -day childcare would be communal, while parenting would be left to the big stuff. A gathering couple might supervise a hunting couple's children as well as their own, and when the hunting party returned, they would trade and the hunting couple would watch the gathering couple's children in return. If a woman was nursing, either her husband would simply have to go alone or another member of the flock might pull a double shift. Yes, almost exactly. You've got it like almost exactly right. It wouldn't be completely inflexible, but I think hunting partners would form the backbone of a flock. 
The single hunters and flock hoppers might trade around a lot between partners, which would be a good way for them to get to know each other and date. Also, when the flock hoppers took their days off, watching the flock's children would be a good way for them to carry their weight and show their responsibility and build trust with their potential new family. Do they have breeding seasons or something like that, or is it just random? It's not random. Most babies are born in the winter. We actually had like a really thorough discussion of this topic over on the Discord, but I don't want to repeat it all here. I'm not really comfortable talking about sexual topics on this channel, and I have in the past some, but I want to kind of redraw my line and pull back a bit. I know there are children who watch these videos, I've got the stats. And yes, I know 12 year olds are exposed to inappropriate topics all the time, and it's probably not that big of a deal, but that doesn't mean I have to add to it. I wonder if any flocks make parents take a vow to their children when they're born, promising to care for the child and all that. I don't think so. I feel like taking care of your children can be equated to taking care of yourself. Not everybody does, but it is expected. However, I love the idea of adoption vows. That would be like partnership vows and flock vows in that you aren't biological family and you don't owe each other anything, but you choose to become family and take on that responsibility as though you were biological. An adoption vow would fit perfectly with that mentality. If oath-breaking is so heavily looked down upon, what would happen if two oaths end up conflicting with one another? That's an interesting idea, though I don't think I can answer it on a societal level. That sounds like it could only really be explored through an individual character and story. But it is thought-provoking to consider. You've talked about the Quillian considering domestication of animals as going against the animal's free will, but meeting one in an open and honest fight is good. So what about wounded, deformed, young, or otherwise easier prey where the animal can't fight for itself? Is it okay to trick animals with traps and such? I feel like open and honest battle implies that the animal and the human is equal, or that the animal at least has a fighting chance. I think that the answer might be that there is an unspoken gradient, and also that it's about more than physical skill. For example, with trapping, you have won through intelligence rather than a physical fight. Hunting something like a lion, where the human is definitely not equal, would be highly honored, because you've won. Hunting a lame animal would not be super honorable, but neither would it be dishonorable. It's more of a mercy kill at that point. I don't think that their species would survive if they only ate animals that they had to about die killing. <laughs> I don't know, I just can't see them being very high-minded about the food that they need to survive. It might not be perfectly logical, but I feel like it's very cohesive with the justice system, where they believe jailing you would be too cruel, but a warranted execution execution is just fine. So like in their mind, raising an animal for the slaughter is messed up, but an animal that led a free life and then is hunted and eaten before nature slowly kills it is moral. I can imagine one young but very patient guy saving a whole year's worth of shed primary feathers and cropping the tips of a bunch of his feathers to double their length for a festival. I actually want to sort of walk back my feather transplanting and extensions idea. I'm sure that that has happened before, and I'm sure that they've also tried extending their feathers for extra flight lift. But shed feathers are shed for a reason, and they aren't the same as fresh new feathers. Also, a feather transplant would be inherently weaker than a natural feather because there is that joint and the glue. So it would definitely be useful to know how to transplant. Transplants would certainly be better than having no feathers, and transplanting one or two feathers for aesthetic reasons wouldn't be too harmful. But I want to be careful not to overuse the concept. I know you want your Quellian to be a pre-writing civilization, but have you considered Kippus? Incas and other Altiplano cultures used patterns of knots to convey information. It is probably why Incas never developed writing, as they had a perfect substitute for it to keep and transmit important information. Quellian already used knots in their textile works, so it wouldn't be a huge jump to develop Kippus. Yes, I like this idea a lot. I'm interested in the Quellian being preliterate because of the way your brain develops and the way your memory works is so different for preliterate cultures. Now I have heard that Kippus might have worked less like a writing system and more as a way to trigger individual memories, sort of like a mind palace if you ever looked into that during the days of BBC Sherlock. I've written one of my Quellian characters as picking up math very quickly because he's used to keeping track of numbers and solving problems in his head. I think that there are a ton of ways Kippus could be used in Quellian society. I can see an elder wearing an elaborate Kippus belt or necklace and using it to calculate and record food supplies in his root cellar. I can see a storyteller running his fingers down different chords, feeling the knots and remembering the start of the next paragraph in his epic. And I can see young hunters wearing just a little kippus tassel, each knot representing a milestone in their life. A knot tied after their first solo kill, a knot for the day they left their flock. I love the idea of kippus being used very personally, not as something that you can send to another and expect them to read, but something that only you can understand. Maybe children could attach a string to the frisbee and fly it similar to a kite. 
Then other children will fly up and try and catch it. The kid controlling the kite tries to evade the others. This would develop better motor control when it comes to flying and better evasion tactics. Think of it like kite fighting, but the other kites are flying children. <laughs> I love this so much. I have nothing to add. I just love the image in my head right now. <laughs> There were several comments about the types of games that they could play. Using these comments as an aggregate, I think board games with the boards drawn onto the back of furs or into the dirt, and then pieces made of stone or bones or other easy to find disposable objects would be best. Also, knuckle bones were a common suggestion as a form of dice, and I like that idea a lot. This comment suggested children carrying their game pieces in a little pouch tied to their clothes as a way to get them used to the idea of carrying their own possessions. I like that a lot too. And then there were the cat comments. I think I know what's going on here. Because not every culture in history has had domesticated cats or pet cats. So why are there so many people who are so insistent that cats should be the exception to the non-domestication rule? Well, I think that we're both doing some wish fulfillment right now, and the difference is that you love cats, and I don't. So you're all like, but cats should be allowed. And I'm like, why? <laughs> I could come up with justifications. Historically, rodents have been the biggest problem with farming communities where large amounts of grain are stored. There aren't currently any small species of cat on the plane to domesticate, and so I would have to add them specifically so that the quillian could have cats. The quillian might associate cats with Nashtiotso lions and want nothing to do with them, except maybe to send off the children on a tiny lion hunt. Like, even if there are small cats, they aren't guaranteed to be domesticatable, like the contrast between zebras and horses. If anything were to self-domesticate, I think it would be some kind of bird, possibly a corvid, but I don't know, Quillian have a very aggressive relationship with animal life, and I'm just not seeing it right now. Like, I don't see an exception. If they're going to hold the non-domestication rule, like, strictly, which we don't have a rule like that, I just don't see self-domestication self being an unavoidable fact of life that's just going to happen whether they want it or not. Will you make a parrot or corvid race? It'd be interesting to see an avian race that's properly the most intelligent on the world. Yes to both. Both are on the list. I see the corvid race being widespread and known for intelligence. The parrot people might not be recognized as that intelligent because they're going to be kind of isolated in a tropical rainforest and will be modeled a bit after Amazonian tribal cultures. So I like the idea of them using their environment and perfecting poisons and traps, which is inherently chemistry and physics and engineering. So yeah, lots of fun stuff there in the future. If leg feathers are really beneficial, and say another species was super intelligent, I feel like they could invent a sort of fake tail. Yes, I'm thinking this for the Corvid race. I'm thinking their traditional clothing will include some sort of like harem pants or glider suit, or something that stretches taut across the legs. I'm curious about the book showing an illustration of an igloo. It's a fantastic book. I think I picked it up at an old library sale. It's called The Igloo by Charlotte and David Yue. It's got so many great illustrations and diagrams really showing the tools and methods Inuits would have used to live. Right up my alley. And thank you for this comment because I was thinking about this book and how I wished that they'd written more. And then I looked it up and they did. There's like three different Native American ones and a couple other random ones. So like I bought them all. They're like super cheap on eBay. Look them up. Can you make a race based on Japanese culture? Okay, there's kind of a funny story with this one. When I was in high school and first working on the Nauticans, I was kind of using Japanese inspiration. The character I've mentioned before, Tsari, spelt T-Z-A-R-I, was originally Tsuri, spelt T-S-U-R-I, which is Japanese for fishing. The reason for this is because in high school, I had never heard of manga or anime, and I had no clue that Japanese culture was like relevant in Western countries. So I picked Japanese inspiration because I was like, here's a nice obscure culture that I can draw from. <laughs> so yeah, about that. <laughs> Anyways, I think that's why all of these years later, I settled on Thai as my primary inspiration for the Nauticans. An Asian island culture just seemed right for them, but I like the more South Asian Oceania direction that they went. I sort of doubt I'll directly base a fantasy people off of Japanese culture in the future because I know virtually nothing about Japan. I know so much more about China. And there are just so many people that do know a lot about Japan, and I know that I would never get it right enough for them. So I just am not that interested in trying. But maybe China. I know a lot more about China. I've been to China twice. And finally, a small bit of affirmation. Somebody on Discord pointed out that Tolkien spent 21 years world building Middle Earth before The Hobbit was published, and 38 years world building before Lord of the Rings was. And if his work became one of the greatest, most enduring classics of the modern era, well, maybe don't rush yourself. He didn't world build the clothing nearly as thoroughly as I would have, but that's okay. That's the point. 
you spend the time on the things that you care about, which for Tolkien was conlanging and complex histories. I firmly believe in following the things that you're passionate about because that is what you're going to do the best work on. And I believe that if you do anything, anything well enough, it has the potential to become valuable to others. <sighs> okay, that was a long one. The next video is going to be so much fun. We're taking a break from the Quellian because I want to introduce other avians and other races, but before I can do that, I really do need to explain the magic system behind them because, yeah. <laughs> so the next video is going to be on green magic. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more of my work, you can subscribe to me here on YouTube and follow my Instagram. Don't forget to check the description box if you want to join the Discord community and explore more lore. And I also have my main YouTube channel for sewing. See ya.